Good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing? It's, it's dry in here, right? That's better than it is outside. So I just wanted to take a minute and say thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I'm Shannon DeVille. I'm the director of the Shriner Institute, which houses all of our military programs and veteran resources. And um, just wanted to tell you a little bit about what we do and then turn it over to Dr. Frazier to introduce our lecturer tonight. Um, so all these young people you see up here in the camouflage uniform are individuals who either are trying to get to a service academy, such as West Point, the Naval Academy, Coast Guard Academy, um, Air Force Academy. Maybe I'll mention that one. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, or um, they are doing ROTC, or they have a passion to serve after their time here at Shriner. Um, so we're very lucky to have them with us this evening and to be part of our programming. Um, and then we also, oh. And then also um, our veteran resources is another area that we take care of here on campus. So a little over 10% of our population is veteran affiliated on the Shriner campus, um, which is a pretty, pretty large number in comparison to a lot of other institutions across the nation. So we have about 140 students that are either veterans themselves or veteran affiliated, meaning their sons, daughters, spouses. Um, some of them are utilizing benefits through the educational benefits program, but not all of them. So um, that's enough for me though. We're here tonight to, to hear from our wonderful speaker. And in order to introduce him, I'd like to have Dr. Don Frazier come up here and, and make the introduction. Thanks, Shannon. This was a, uh, a great opportunity to showcase Shriner Institute to folks that may not know it, may not be aware of it, because this is not a Texas topic. Now, I'm Don Frazier, and I run the Texas Center here at Shriner University, and I spend an awful lot of time thinking Texas, speaking Texas, writing Texas, that sort of thing. But I had a life before the Texas Center, and that life included... Bob Wedham, whom I have known since he was 19. I met him, uh, well, I met him, I can't remember exactly when we met, but I remember vividly an incident when we were both at a Civil War reenactment in Prairie Grove, Arkansas, and it was so cold, and we were having this sort of bonding moment of all being equally miserable. And from that point on, I was able to track his career uh, as he went to Texas A&M University, as he went on and got his, uh, his doctorate. And when I had an opportunity to hire a fresh, newly minted professor, uh, I turned to Bob Wedeman, and he came and joined me on faculty at a different school here in the state of Texas. So Bob and I were colleagues on the same faculty uh, for a good while. And he was lured away to serve in the cadre, teaching cadre, of the United States Air Force Academy, uh, where he's been in some capacity, one way or the other, since 2007. Uh, he did some time uh, at Fort Bragg as a historian of that uh, Special Operations Command there. Uh, but ultimately, his passion has been in Colorado Springs. And what I, what I love about uh, Bob in his role at the Air Force Academy is that he is a mentor and he feeds cadets in his home and we were driving up and he said you know what's amazing to me is I'll watch the news and I'll see some you know F-15 strike eagle or some other uh, piece of the Air Force inventory and I'll know that there's a pretty good chance that whoever's behind that stick may have gone through my house and had barbecue with me. So that's pretty cool to be able to uh, have that influence. I asked him, I said, how come you were never in the military? And his excuse was the same as mine. You know, first of all, I marched a trombone. I did not play football, so the PT test was not my friend. But we were both military historians and have a passion for those who serve, even though we never wore the uniform. And he's been able to manifest that by being an academic at the Air Force Academy. And uh, when he said that he was swinging by, we haven't seen each other since 2007, since he went to Air Force. Well, I, I take that back. He did come back 
for the big book signing event when we were doing the Phil Collins book. But that's a whole different story. Anyhow, he came back. We had that event, and he's been up in Colorado Springs, and I've been here in the state of Texas doing my thing. Uh, so when he said that he was passing through and that he would swap a public lecture in exchange for a room and board, I said, great, come ahead on. And so uh, that's the genesis of this event. I'm a huge backer, big fan of what's going on at Schreiner Institute. And I said, look, there's some way we can kind of marry this up. And uh, the guys over there, uh, Shannon Roosevelt, both said, absolutely, we're happy to do it. I'm really happy to see the cadets. Um, these, man, these are the standard bearers on campus. In case you get a chance to visit with them, I highly encourage you to do it. I don't think there's a better representation of what we're doing at this school than what's going on over at Shriner Institute. So that said, uh, I'm gonna welcome Bob to come up and tell us about sticky bombs and rhino tanks. And I've only been hearing about this since he was about 19, I think. And now this thing is about to be a book. And when the book comes out, which is probably next year, now it's Oklahoma University, right? Yes. That's the other school in yes. Oklahoma. Not OSU where you went. Um, but we were on the field last week. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, uh, if you want to know about that book, there are sign-up sheets in the back. And he'll add you to a mailing list, and when the book breaks, he'll let you know, and you can get your copy, and maybe if you run it past him, he'll sign it. So, Bob, welcome to Shriner University. Thank you, Don. You bet. Thank you very much. Great. It's great to be back with you, Don. Thanks for having me, Shannon. Thank you. Thank you, cadets, for being here this evening. It means a lot. It's nice to see. I've been on sabbatical since July, so I haven't seen people in uniform, so it's nice to see, you know, some can't, well, I mean, I can't see you because of the camouflage, but you know. So, so let, let me start first by kind of giving the genesis of this project that, that really started, you know, I started thinking of it in 2000, 2001, as I was thinking about the possibility of going to McMurray University and teaching as a 20th century historian, as one who had done most of his PhD work in his dissertation on the 19th century army. And, and Don reached out, as he said, and having known me for a number of years, and, and wanting to participate as, as part of a team, which we did for, for a great period of time, a great period starting out, but I needed a 20th century research project. And I was thinking about, okay, what am I going to do next? And you might recall that 25 years ago, there was a little movie that came out called Saving Private Ryan. And recognizing that most of that movie, aside from their yes being a D-Day and probably that very compelling first 25 minutes of the film, once you got beyond that, we've got to recognize almost all of it is fiction. Particularly this scene in particular, which captured my attention. Care of it, Captain. It's just that everything depends on getting the tank down this main road for us to knock out, right? So how the hell do you plan on doing that? Right was right. As our esteemed colleague from the airport pointed out, what we got here are a bunch of spit wads. So how do we stop the tank if we get it to commit? Give it a rapid to chase. We could hit the tank in the tracks. Yeah, but with what? We could try a sticky bomb. Sticky bomb, sir? So are you making that up? No, it's in the field manual. You can check it out if you want to. But we seem to be out of field manuals, sir. Perhaps you can enlighten us. All right, you have some demolition, don't you? Some TMT or some Composition B? Yeah, that, sir, is the one thing we got plenty of. I got that bridge wire with enough Composition B to blow it twice. All right, you can spare some, then. You take a standard issue GI sock, cram it with as much Comp B as it can hold, rig up a simple fuse, and you coat the whole thing with axle grease. That way, when you throw it, it should stick. It's a bomb that sticks. It's a sticky bomb. Come up with a better way to knock the tracks off a tank. I'm all ears. This is good. Now we got to surrender our socks. So this got me thinking, right? How much of this was real and how much of it was just a figment of the Hollywood imagination? You know, knowing that ultimately at its core, Saving Private Ryan was a work of fiction, 
did something like this actually happen? Did you have a group of American soldiers realize a problem, realize they had technology available that could help solve the problem, and drawing upon experiences they may have had elsewhere, take the piece of technology, modify it in some way, and make it function in a new purpose. So starting with the sticky bomb, as a historian, I started digging. And I actually found a solution that showed up in Popular Mechanics magazine in 1943, where you have those three elements you have that piece of technology, you have a need, and you have a ability to modify, a ability to fall back on something you knew, in this case, the experiences in America's sandlot baseball fields. So let's take this notion to the next level, this idea of modifying technology based upon your previous experiences. So to understand the World War II GI, the World War II Airman, the World War II Sailor, the World War II Marine, what's their base of experience? Growing up in the 1920s and the 1930s in the midst of the Great Depression, growing up in a society in which the machine was king. And the young people growing up were very much familiar with people like them working with machine technology, modifying it to solve problems. Whether or not it was Tom Swift, the boy inventor. Whether or not it was the Hardy Boys, with their chum, the portly Chet Morton, who were always working on their jalopies. Young men who were reading Popular Mechanics magazine in the midst of the Great Depression, where everyone had to use it up, wear it out, make it do, or do without. And you have people who maybe a little bit presciently understood the power of Yankee ingenuity. Former cavalry officer Major Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson, in August 1941, just a few months before Pearl Harbor, in Mechanics Illustrated magazine, one of a similar vein of popular science, popular mechanics, wrote about how Yankee ingenuity would help defeat Hitler because of America's ability to understand the machine. Now, there were lots of people who understood that those men who would be GIs in World War II would understand the machine. During the Depression, future Chief of Staff George Marshall would work with the Civilian Conservation Corps in Georgia and the Pacific Northwest and understand that those young men were not only ingenious, but new machines. Marshall himself, when he had been in the Philippines in 1916, bought a Model T, took it apart, put it back together, just so he understood how it ran. That was a common trend among young Americans in the 1920s and 1930s. So much so that in 1940, when Marshall was before Congress, seeking additional appropriation to mechanize the United States military, to do away with horses, and come to rely upon the internal combustion engine, Marshall said in his congressional testimony, almost every boy in this country knows how to handle a motor vehicle, and many of them understand a great deal about motor equipment. This was something that was unique to the United States. And I know I'm probably going to have people who are going to attack the notion of an American exceptionalism argument. But what better way to prove your point than to use lies, damn lies, and statistics? So let's look at per capita auto automobile ownership in 1939. And look at the number on top, the United States, and the rest of the Axis and allies underneath. And I won't ask you to do math in public, cadets, right? But what number is bigger, <laughs> right? The United States. One car for every, or 227 cars for every 1,000 people. That's almost what? One car for every family of four. And these aren't like 
Don's big truck that we came in tonight where you throw your fob in the console, push your button, and, and it, your engine comes on, right? This is a Model T. This is a Model A. These are vehicles that, yes, because of Henry Ford's ability to democratize the automobile, not only can everyone get one, and you can all get them in, in whatever color you want, as long as it's black, but these are cars that you almost need to be a mechanic just to get them started. These are the vehicles that Americans are familiar with on the eve of World War II. This is the, the cultural mindset that American GIs are coming from when the President of the United States makes some pretty bold pronouncements. When he said he wants to be in a position in 1940 to, to build 50,000 airplanes in a single year. That's more than were produced, than had been produced since the Wright brothers made their first flight in 1903. And Roosevelt wants to turn this around as he's thinking about the United States becoming an arsenal of democracy and turn that productive capability and make it work in the United States. So the question becomes, how do you do it? You go to the automotive industry. You go to Ford Motor Company. And one of their vice presidents, Charles Sorensen, who had worked himself up from the shop floor and helped essentially design what we recognize as the assembly line. The War Department came to Ford. Henry Ford went to Sorensen, took Cast Iron Charlie, said, you go out to San Diego and take Edsel and his boys with you and see what the Consolidated Aircraft Manufacturing Company is doing in San Diego. Meet with President Reuben Fleet and see how they're building their airplanes. Sorensen showed up and spent the day with Reuben Fleet, walking around their outdoor factory where they were building basically one B-24 a day. As Sorensen described it, they were building the B-24s like a tailor would make a suit of clothes, measuring each individual part and making it work, modifying it as you went along. And by the end of the day, as you look at 1.25 million parts in a single B-24 airplane, Sorensen turned to President Fleet and said, you've got to do it faster than that. To which... Fleet said, how are you going to do it? Charlie Sorensen said, I'll come back tomorrow and tell you. He goes down to Coronado Hotel in San Diego, and that night, understanding how the B-24 is built, he breaks the construction of the aircraft into nine component parts, and then he tracks backwards out of that 1.25 million parts that go into a single B-24, where those line up in a production scheme. And on little pieces of paper on the floor of the hotel room, Sorensen works until 4.30 in the morning, translating his technical know-how into the construction of ultimately what will become the Willow Run factory outside of Detroit. And within 16 months, not only is Ford Motor Company at Willow Run cranking out B-24s, but they go from a plane taking 140,000 man hours and reducing it to 100,000. Building a mile long assembly line with 54 individual sub assembly stations within that one building, 80 acres of covered floor space, so you don't have to worry about the, heating, the constant heating and contraction of aluminum, heating and cooling contraction that you have in San Diego. And within 16 months, they're not building a plane a day, they are building a plane an hour. And that will not only be extended just to the B-24, but it will make that, that same production process will make its way to other airframes that the United States will employ during World War II demonstrating this understanding of machine technological 
capability. Most of this is taking place really as the war was getting started, but even as World War II began and the United States is sucked in on December 7th, 1941, you will see those airmen and sailors on the ground from the very beginning demonstrating this technical creativity. As Douglas MacArthur said when he was superintendent of West Point in 1920, improvisation will be the watchword. We're going to make do with what you have. You're going to have to make do with what you have because in some cases, you're not getting anything else. American servicemen, because of the decision to motorize the military, will have access to machines. Because they grew up in the United States during the Great Depression with access to cars, motorcycles, trucks, they will have this technical understanding that when you pair both of those with flexible, innovative leadership that trusts their subordinates, when someone says, I've got an idea, that makes a difference. Even if that idea is pulling out shop tables from hangars on Pearl Harbor and using the vices to clamp down machine guns that you've stripped out of wrecked PBY Catalina flying boats just so you can return fire as these airmen were in, uh, excuse me, as these sailors were in Kanoe Naval Air Station. This took place in between the first and second raids at Pearl Harbor. And this continues in the first major offensive operation conducted by American Air Forces during World War II, the Doolittle Raid. Recognizing that at that time, if you were going to drop a bomb on a target, most of the doctrine up to that point had called for high altitude bombing. And to solve the challenges of putting bombs on target, they had a top secret bit of technology known as the Norden Bombsight. Now, if you know anything about the Norden bomb site and how was it designed and to be employed versus what the Doolittle Raiders were going to do, the Norden bomb site is designed for high altitude precision bombing. And it was a top secret bit of technology. So if you're a Doolittle Raider coming in low on the deck and knowing that you were going to go ditch your plane in either China or the Soviet Union, the last thing you wanted to have happen was to have a top secret bit of technology fall into the hands of the Chinese or the Russians, even in 1942. So Doolittle turned the problem over to his bomb officer, Captain Ross Greening, who came up with what came to be known as the Mark Twain, something they built from just a few cents worth of scrap aluminum. And if you look in the lower left there, reproduced Mark Twain that's there courtesy of the National Air Force Museum and Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, you, know, you see what kind of resembles a paddle wheel steamer that you would have seen on the Mississippi River, hence the name the Mark Twain. And you look at that horizontal bar, and on either end of that horizontal bar, there were two notches that the bombardier would line up based on speed and altitude, and when you passed over the target, that's when you knew when you dropped your bombs. Now, granted, right, they're not going to be that accurate anyway. This is 1942, but even just dropping bombs on Japan would have significant enough psychological value. But they were making do with what they had. This was going to be the challenge, particularly in the Pacific in the early phases of the war, as General George Kenney discovered when he's called upon to take over command of the Far East Air Forces, what eventually becomes the Fifth Air, For Fifth Air Force in the Southwest Pacific. He has to make do with what they had. Now, there are a few things that before he went out to Australia, as he writes in his memoirs, I did what any officer in his right mind would do. Remember this, you go out and scrounge. And what does he scrounge? A squadron of P-38 Lightnings that nobody wants sends them to Australia. Finds about 3,000 parafrags, fragmentation bombs that are equipped with parachutes. So they fall slowly. Now, we'll come back to that in a minute. 
But once he gets out to Australia and he finds you know, what's left of the air forces that had limped their way from the Philippines to New Guinea to Australia, comes to the conclusion, we are not going to scrap any more aircraft. Those aircraft that are in the boneyard, that's not the boneyard, that's our equipment warehouse. We're going to take everything from those planes that we can possibly use. As he said, stock, instruments, spark plugs. Make do with what you have. And he turns to who he will call his super gadgeteer and all-around fixer, Pappy Gunn, who had been flying in, Phil in the Philippines for the Army before the war when the Philippines fell. He kind of makes his way, ends up in Australia, and he's, Kenny arrives to find him uncrating P-40 Warhawk aircraft and building them on the docks in Brisbane, taking them out of the crates and putting the planes together because he needs something to do. This is an engineer officer who wanted to fly in World War I, isn't there in time, the war ends too quickly, goes through the Navy, gets his pilot's wings, he's flying for Pan Am, then commissioned by the Army, now he's putting planes together. And then he starts to figure out, okay, we've got these parafrags, what can we do? Pappy Gunn builds what Kenny will call a squirrel cage to mount in the back of a B-25. A squirrel cage that will hold these fragmentation bombs that you can use when you want to fly over Japanese airfields on New Guinea at a low altitude. But remember, they're fragmentation bombs. If they're just fragmentation bombs, you're probably going to get shrapnel damage to your own aircraft. But those parachutes are going to slow them down and allow them to be a little bit more accurate. So you can see them dropping on a Japanese aircraft down in the Dutch uh, Dutch East Indies in 1930. So you've got the squirrel cage and the parafrags. Then Kenny tasks, he comes to his, you know, one of those questions that, that you might expect a shade tree mechanic to ask in, in similar circumstances, and it might be prefaced with a phrase like, here, hold my beer. Kenny goes to gun and he says, how many machine guns can you put in the nose of a B-25? Isn't that the kind of question you want to get? Right? And Gunn works at it, tries a number of permutations, has to make some adjustments, and he eventually is able to put 12 forward-firing machine guns, 50 caliber, all firing a slug as big around as your thumb. This, folks, is the forerunner of the A-10 Warthog before it was cool. Right? Particularly when you're employing both of these against lightly armored or unarmored Japanese aircraft or surface shipping, as they do in the Battle of Bismarck's Fee in March of 1943, where you add to that not only parafrags, not only these commerce raiders, but how many of you have ever taken a flat rock and skipped it across a body of water? Did you know you can do the same thing if you're coming in at the right altitude and right airspeed with a 150-pound bomb? And if you put a time delay fuse on it, when it hits the hull of a, a ship, it won't detonate. It will sink down underwater and then detonate and use the compressive force of the explosion to punch a hole in the hull of the ship, which they do to great effect in the Battle of Bismarck Sea, as I said, in March of 1943. The Japanese were trying to reinforce New Guinea with a convoy of eight destroyers, eight transports, carrying more than 3,000 Japanese reinforcements. American force, air forces commanded by Kenny get all of the transports, half of the destroyers, and kill almost 3,000 Japanese reinforcements. So this is all happening early in the Pacific theater of the operations. But this ph phenomenon is not confined to the PTO because George Patton understood the nature of the American servicemen as well. Here was an old cavalry soldier who in World War I takes over with the tanks, still deep down inside, you know, probably wishing he was still on a horse. 
coming up with a new armored uniform that looked a little ostentatious, but that was probably just Patton, right? Envisioning these great armored sweeps like you would with cavalry during the Civil War. But then the question is, how do you support your flanks? You've got to have something to do with it. You need some element of support. We'll get back to that in a minute. But you do need the opportunity to see over the horizon. Now, when you're in North Africa, that's relatively easy because your airfields are relatively close. When you start making your way across the Mediterranean, you don't have the range for support aircraft from North Africa to Sicily for your observation aircraft that are going to be used as artillery spotters. You don't have any aircraft carriers because the one aircraft carrier that had ferried, ferried fighters over at the beginning of the war now over in the Pacific Theater where they really need aircraft carriers. So what do you do? Build your own. Take a landing ship tank, an LST, or a large slow target. And somebody had the idea, hey, what if we put a deck on an LST? We can launch a light observation plane off of the LST, won't be able to land, so we got to make sure we secure our beaches in Sicily. He can land and refuel there. And when they brought this to some of the pilots, the first guy, well, I can't say what he said, but it was no. Perhaps a little bit more forcefully. But Bill Cummings did try it, landed, refueled, went back up again, and then the early landings in Sicily made a world of difference for troops on the ground. Now, as we continue the war over Hitler's Europe, and when we talk about young men familiar with machines, we can look no further than the commander of the 305th Bomb Group, old iron ass himself, Curtis LeMay. When he was in college, during one of the summers, he was going home with one of his buddies in his car, and they came across a garage in his buddy's hometown that had just been burned in a fire. And there were a bunch of damaged automobiles in various stages of um, incineration. The fire had been put out, but LeMay's looking at these and saying, you know, if one of those engines turns over, it's better than my car. And I can start with that, and you know, my car's not that good, but it's got four good tires. And I bet we can go to a junkyard and see if we can't get a frame and some wiring. So he goes to what's left of the garage, deals with the insurance agent. One of the cars turns over. I'll take that one. Goes to the junkyard, gets a body, gets some wiring, and he and his buddy over the course of, get ready for this, 24 hours, build a car from parts of three different automobiles. That's the kind of technical thinking that Curtis LeMay is going to use in realizing that Perhaps, if, if I use some of my college calculus and an ROTC artillery manual, I can calculate the effective accuracy of a German 88 millimeter flak cannon and come to con con some conclusions as to whether or not in a bombing formation we can fly straight at one altitude for any length of time without having catastrophic losses. Those who had come before Curtis LeMay, when he met them en route to England, they'd say, no, you've got to come in, you've got to make it short, you've got to come in from an angle. And consequently, they were slinging bombs all over everywhere. Curtis LeMay ran those calculations and then started figuring out how can we best organize our bomb squadrons to allow them to effectively make use of the multiple 50 caliber machine guns on the B-17 Flying Fortress. And this is where Curtis LeMay comes up with the Combat Box, that organization that you see in the lower left-hand corner. A formation of Vs that would allow those machine guns, be they waist guns, top turret, ball turret, tail gunner, to support, mutually support all the aircraft in the formation. 
except as those airmen found out on their first raid over San Nazir, a German pilot, Egon Mayer, realizing that the most vulnerable point on the combat box was coming in at, as the movie is known, 12 o'clock high. Because there weren't nose guns in a B-17. There were two on either side, usually 30 calibers in, in cheek turrets, as they call it, but nothing facing forward. And after the first couple of missions, some of those airmen on the ground said, hey, we got to do something about this. And three different squadrons at all about the same time, though separated by about 30 miles in England, all came up with similar solutions. We're going to figure out some way to put nose guns into a B-17. Kenny would do the same thing in the Pacific, take the tail turret out of a B-24 and figure out how to mount it in the nose. And when he goes back to Washington, they were telling him, no, you can't, the engineers were saying, no, you can't do it. And he says, done it already, got the t-shirt. Send me some nose turrets. Send me some turrets and I'll do that in the field. And that's what they kept doing. But in later models that were modified in field modification centers that they set up, because you didn't want to constantly change the pattern of your aircraft to ensure that you could make them in the numbers that you wanted, so you'd modify them in the field, they would have modification centers that would add these features. Recognizing that planes sent to England are going to be different from planes sent to France, or excuse me, from to the South Pacific, you don't need de-icers if you're putting your planes in the Southwest Pacific. You need that in France and England, or in England. Different needs, different requirements, but there's always this element of modification. Then we get to boots on the ground in the Bocage country in France, which is something that none of the intelligence experts saw ahead of time. The hedgerows that were there in France, they aren't the hedgerows of the hill country. The hedgerows are not a couple of strands of barbed wire, no. These are Norman fields that have been like that for centuries. Six, eight, ten feet wide, as many feet tall. Trees, bushes, shrubbery, all intertwined. And if you wanted to go over one in a tank, you're going to expose the belly of the tank, probably the most weakly armored portion of the tank. So if you are thinking in terms of those great armored sweeps that Patton wanted, it only took a few Germans with a couple of Panzerfaust or an 88 millimeter gun to totally dominate a road. So how are you going to restore mobility to the battlefield. The 747th Tank Battalion came up with what they called the salad prongs. Pieces of pipe and they would drive into a hedgerow, punch a couple of holes, then back up. Then into those holes, engineers would shove pre-prepared spent shell casings with explosives, run those wires back and then command, detonate the explosive and blow the hole in a hedgerow. Sounds like a good solution, right? Well, let's take the Germans into account first, right? The first or second time the 747th might get away with it with one tank, right? Then you have one hole through a hedgerow. How are you going to move a whole tank battalion through that one hole? Because what do you think the Germans were going to do with all of their fire? Concentrated on that one spot. And if you try it again, they're pretty soon you're going to figure out wherever the hedgerow shakes, that's where it's going to blow up next. Now, the other challenge to all of this, when you think of the number of tanks in a tank battalion and wanting to move through hedgerows with these great armored sweeps, if you're going to move a mile or two and go through 4, 5, 10, 16 hedgerows with multiple holes, how many tons of explosives are you going to need? 
This isn't a public math problem, so I won't make you take off your shoes so you can get to 20. Right? All of your logistical support is still coming over Omaha Beach. This isn't going to work. Although, on some cases, if they mounted those prongs low enough and you got a head of, good enough head of steam at a smaller hedgerow, maybe you could just punch through with just the salad prongs, which gets tankers thinking, right? Remember back on Omaha Beach, all of those steel tetrahedrons that the Germans had constructed hoping to rip the hulls off the bottom of the landing craft. What if we take those, cut them up, and make big rhino tusks to go on the front of the tanks? Now, some of them were referred to as, as rhino tanks, generally speaking. They had hedge clippers, hedge choppers, took pieces of railroad rail, made what they called a green dozer because they had limited number of dozer blades that they could mount on the M4 mediums. But the solution was all the same. Let's build these and let's test them. They run a secret test. Bradley is there, General Omar Bradley, General Patton. They run a secret test. Hey, it works. Let's start building these. We build them in secret, build them inside so the Germans can't see what we're doing. Manufacture almost 500 of them so that 60% of the tanks in First Army, when you get to Operation Cobra, the breakout from Normandy in July of 1944, have rhino tank apparatus that they use to punch through the hedgerows, to restore a sense of mobility to the battlefield. 20 years later, when Eisenhower goes back to Normandy with Walter Cronkite, he will talk about the contributions of the little cavalry sergeant in building this battlefield innovation that will very effectively solve a problem. But remember, we're dealing with a nation of tinkerers, guys that see a need, Look at the technology around them. Realize that, hey, those, those lightweight 30 caliber machine guns that are normally in the, in the wings of airplanes, those are light enough that a man could carry them. What if, here hold my beer, we mount the stock of an M1 carbine, a carrying handle from a Browning automatic rifle, and a bipod, along with the ammunition box, we've essentially built a squad automatic weapon out of spare parts that Tony Stein that would use his stinger to great effect until he could get a Congressional Medal of Honor on Iwo Jima. Harry Tyson saying, hey, there's this minefield, we need to clear it. Let's take an inner mortar round and on the back of it, let's tie like, oh, I don't know, four or five hundred foot long strands of Primacord that we braided together because we can shoot that inert round into the minefield, then detonate the prime accord, clear a path, and now we'll have a place to move through this obstacle. Multiple barrels or multiple bazookas mounted on a machine gun mount in Italy. Forrest Guth of Easy Company, the Band of Brothers took the pockets off the front of his jump jacket, mounted them on the sleeves. He'd grown up in the Pennsylvania Dutch country, was always making something out of nothing. When he gets to the Battle of the Bulge, he's the company armorer for Easy Company, which means he carries the tools to allow them to keep their weapons functional. Takes an M1A1 carbine, field strips it, open it up, lays it next to a German machine pistol, then goes to work filing on the M1 carbine's parts, field modifies it, and converts it to fully, a fully automatic weapon. Charles Carpenter, a history professor from, or history teacher from a high school in Illinois, flying one of those light observation airplanes, wants a little bit more teeth. So he mounts multiple bazookas under each wing that can be command detonated from the cockpit. 
takes multiple German tanks out in fighting around Metz. There is no single vehicle that was, as, was important to the American soldier as the Jeep, as, as a proud Jeep owner. Omar Bradley said there were three vehicles that made a difference during World War II. The Jeep, the two and a half ton truck, and the C-47. The Jeep itself was one of these efforts at improvisation. Both in their construction and their use. A former Navy commander, Charles Harry Payne, who was working in the automotive industry, when the Army was looking for a light vehicle, because of his familiarity with the industry, was basically able to go to a parts department, pull tires from one company, axles from another, transmission from another, radiator, cobble together a sheet metal frame, and basically improvised the first Jeep, which was subsequently sent for trials by the Bantam Car Company. Except the Bantam Car Company was so small that they couldn't produce the numbers that the military needed. So Ford and Willis ended up cranking out a vehicle that most foreign soldiers thought Americans were issued during World War II. There's an account that I found in North Africa. A French soldier was guarding a crossroads at night and he heard some people approaching his position. And he said, halt, advance and be recognized. And the voices from the dark said, we're Americans. And the French soldier gunned them all down came up afterwards and they discovered that those men who claimed to be Americans were actually Germans masquerading as Americans, to which they asked the French soldier, well, how did you know that they weren't Americans? He said, it's easy. Americans would have come in Jeeps. <laughs> Americans would have come in Jeeps. And Americans made use of Jeeps in a variety of forms, whether it was adding, extending the wheels, so you could use them to police the rail lines, armoring them in intelligence and reconnaissance sections, extending the wheelbase so you could operate them in snow and ice. You could use it to make a difference. And it all comes back to these same notions that we've talked about from the beginning. Access to technology realizing a need and taking the bits of machinery around you and adapting them to whatever purpose, whatever function you're going to need. Now, throughout World War II, there were tremendous complaints about American armor and that it wasn't built as heavily armored or as heavily armed as the German military. You think about the Tiger Ones, the Tiger Twos. If you've seen the film Fury, you know, the, the scene where the, the single Tiger tank goes up against four Shermans and is able to get three out of the four, and then you start thinking in terms of the numbers. There were 50,000 plus Sherman tanks in various models produced during World War II. There were less than 2,000 Tiger Ones and Tiger Twos. Not only that, most of those Tigers are going to be employed early on when the Germans really need them, which means most of them are not going to go to the Western Front. They're going to end up in the Eastern Front. Right? So the number of American tankers who actually saw Tigers were probably minimal. But Americans would recognize, we need better armor. What are we going to do? Let's fix things. Belton Cooper, the 2nd, 3rd Armored Division, recognized this relatively early and watched as his tankers were doing everything that they could do with what they could get their hands on to soften up their tanks, to add enough supplemental armor that might slow down an 88 millimeter round. 
that might allow them to have a fighting edge. Spare tank blocks, bogey wheels, sandbags, logs, concrete, just about everything you could imagine being hung, placed, racked, framed onto a tank to add some supplemental armor. By the end of the war, they'd actually be cutting out pieces of armor from knocked out tanks, putting those onto the tanks and welding them in place. I said, well, concrete. Or when your tank did not have a turret cover, as did the M10 and the M18 tank destroyers. As early as Sicily, they were scavenging bits of iron plate, figuring out how to mount them to the top of the turret to provide additional protection from machine gun blasts or airbursts. This was a common practice throughout the war. But let's go back to the air crews a bit, right? And when I throw the name John Steinbeck out, what's probably the one book everybody knows best, right? Grapes of Wrath, where after the Joads are bulldozed off their farm in Oklahoma, they have to make their way to California in their old truck, which they just barely keep going, by doing what? The same sorts of things we've been talking about here. Field modifying, right? The truck almost becomes a character of its own during the course of Grapes of Wrath. In 1942, because of his success with the Grapes of Wrath, John Steinbeck is asked by the War Department to go to America's new airfields where they are training the next generation of bomber crews for World War II. Steinbeck makes his way throughout the United States and comes to some really interesting conclusions that he puts together in a 1942 book entitled Bombs Away, which is a fictional biography of a bomber crew, a literary recruiting poster. And you go through the air crew, and there's Joe, the pilot, Bill, the bombardier, Alan, the navigator, special kind of young men who are uniquely suited for the task at hand. Why? Because this is a war of machines. This is a type of fighting that is uniquely suited to the United States. And in particular, Steinbeck singles out one of the crew members. His name is Abner. And you found Abner, he was in every small town in America working at the gas station. And his jalopy, when he drove around town, you never saw it looking the same way twice. The front end was part of one car, the back end was part of another, and the third time probably is from something else. He's that tinkerer that as an aerial engineer, as a crew chief, he was going to be the guys who were going to figure out how are we going to put the nose guns in a B-17? How are we going to take these airplanes that we have, realize a need, and make some changes so that they serve an altogether different purpose? The P-47 Thunderbolt was a good airplane, designed for high altitude escort combat. It would fly along with the B-17s, you could extend its range with drop tanks, one underneath the fuselage in the center, one underneath each wing, until someone had an idea. Squadron Commander Gilbert Wyman, flying in Italy, with the 64th Fighter Squadron, 57th Fighter Group. He's 24 years old. Is that resonating a little bit? 
24 years old as a squadron commander. Goes to one of his pilots, Dwight Orman, one of his maintainers, his Abners, Bill Hahn. Says, hey, look, we got a problem here. I want to use the P-47 for close air support. But not only can we not carry bombs, we can carry bombs, but the challenge is the release handles for the bomb, or for the drop tanks, where we could mount potentially bombs, are way back behind the pilot's seat. And if the pilot's flying and he's got a stick here, it's really awkward to try to do this and drop bombs accurately. So you're going to have to engineer a solution. And you're going to have to do it by tomorrow because the brass is coming and I'm going to demonstrate how we're going to do this with a P-47. Nothing like working under pressure. So Han and Orman sit out during the night and figure out how to mechanically reroute the release mechanism from back behind the pilot's seat. They put a bar across a stick Wires are going down underneath pilot seats here, and they figure out how a pilot who's operating the stick can grab those three toggles, and if we can rig up a rudimentary sight, they'll eventually steal something out of a Spitfire and mount it right there on the canopy. Put all that together, when Wyman the next day takes this new airplane that they've modified, he can put bombs exactly where he wants them coming in at a relatively steep dive, which gives American airmen a new capability with the P-47. This is the plane that will now support Patton's great armored sweeps, so when the Third Army rolls across France, they don't have to worry about their flanks because they have P-47s in the air overhead. Now, there's another modification that is made to enable the P-47s in the air to communicate with the tanks on the ground. And for that, we'll go to Pete Casada, Brigadier General of 9th Tactical Air Command, who has the bright idea, you know, airmen, pilots, and tankers will describe terrain in distinctly different ways ways. A tank at most, you're moving maybe 40 miles an hour. P-47 is screaming over at a much higher speed than that. And if the tank says, well, there's an enemy tank out there behind that tree, in the amount of time he says that, the P-47 has already made probably two or three hedgerows ahead of him. And you need to figure out one somehow to make the tanker speak pilot, right? Casada has the idea, goes to General Bradley and says, can you send me a couple of tanks? I want to put airplane radios in these tanks and then put pilots in the tanks who can talk pilot to pilot and relay what we need to do to tankers. So Bradley says, yep, send two tanks over to the 9th. Tanks roll over to the 9th Infantry Division. Because when Bradley says, send tanks to the 9th, why would you send them to an air outfit? So the tanks get sent back by the 9th Infantry. We don't need any tanks. Casada calls up Bradley, you didn't send me my tanks. Bradley sends them again. This time he sends them to the 9th TAC so they know they're going to the Tactical Air Command. Except nobody told the officer at the 9th Tactical Air Command that they were going to get tanks. No, we don't need any tanks. Send them back to Bradley. It takes about three times before Bradley and Casada get on the same sheet of paper, which just tells you the challenges of tankers and planes communicating with each other. But by August, there are tanks embedded in armored columns rolling across France in which four of the five crewmen are Air Force officers with Air Force radios that can speak pilot to pilot with P-47s in the air. 
And they operate with such success that I found an account of a column of German soldiers who are marching down a road in France. And they see a P-47 coming in to hit them. And what do they do? Immediately start throwing up their white flags and surrendering to a plane in the air. And what does the P-47 do? Just takes a slow circle and waits for the tanks to catch up so they can turn over the prisoners. Now, I told you that long story about Pete Casada to tell you another one. Because he had the reputation of being a bit of a maverick. 4th of July, 1944, Casada is at a briefing at Bradley's 1st Army Headquarters when they are getting ready to launch Operation Cobra. All of the senior American leadership is there. Bradley, Patton, Courtney Hodges, Eisenhower has come over from England, and they're getting ready for Operation Cobra. And as the meeting breaks up, Casada, who hated meetings like this, is on his way back to one of the fighter squadrons operating in Creekville and Bassin, which is just south of Point Du Hoc. They carved out a runway there, Marston Mat, nothing fancy at all. A squadron that was flying the relatively new P-51B Mustang. Not the Mustang with the bubble canopy that we recognize by the end of the war, but this was the Razorback. And Eisenhower sees Casada leaving and says, Pete, what are you doing? Oh, General, sir, I'm going to go fly a mission. Would you like to go with me? Now, as we all should know, the P-51B was a single-seater fighter aircraft, except for one P-51B that had been field modified by taking the gas tank normally found behind the pilot's seat out, taking the radio out, they put in a plywood seat, took with the windows, made it into a hatch so that someone could squeeze in, no room for a parachute, and it was in that plane that Casada, a two-star, and Eisenhower, a four-star, climb into and then fly up over, oh yeah, a contested battle space because Normandy's not secure yet. This is the first time in history that a ground commander is going to be able to see his battlefield from the air in a plane that will subsequently be renamed the Stars Look Down. Because you've got a two-star and a four-star, and I'll say it again, in a field-modified airplane that had been built so you could take pilots up and show them tactics or reward your Abners on the ground by taking them up for an airplane ride. Now, many years later, Casada was asked, You've got Eisenhower behind you. What happened if you ran into some Germans? Casada said, if anything happened, I was going to fly out over the coast, back into the English Channel, flip the plane over, and hope Eisenhower could drop out. <laughs> when they landed, and in the bottom picture, there is actually a piece of Signal Corps film that, I've locate, that I located on YouTube. And it shows the plane landing, and Eisenhower, you know, they open the hatch, Eisenhower starts to climb out, Casada starts to climb. Then when that's done, they're standing there on the rough tarmac. Eisenhower puts his Ike jacket on, hat on. First thing he does, goes for a cigarette. And he's there smoking, and quite literally, it's one of those times that you wish you had the ability to use a forensic lip reader the way that they did um, with P Peter Jackson did in They Shall Not Grow Old. And you wish, because Eisenhower says something to Casada, and they are literally 
smoking and joking, both have cigarettes going. Eisenhower says something, Casada throws his head back laughing. You know, when they just been in this and been in this plane, and you can understand why Bradley would have described the two of them as looking like young schoolboys who had been caught in the watermelon patch. <laughs> and that Eisenhower recognizing that if Marshall ever found out about what I did, hell would be to pay. But here you have this technical ability to for the Abners of the airfield to modify whatever they have at their disposal to improve their way of getting around the airfield. It's not just so Casada can fly with Eisenhower, it's so I don't have to walk all the way to the plane. I don't have to haul my tools all the way to the plane. I can build the creep. I can build a go-kart. Drop tank cars and use those to get around. If you've got spare parts, if you've got an engine, if you've got a wheel, we can make these happen. If you need more anti-aircraft support for landings in Leyte Gulf, you can take a landing craft Go to the boneyard. There's some B-26s laying around with extra turrets. Let's deck over this landing craft. Let's throw an 88 millimeter, or 37 millimeter gun. Let's throw some rockets on this thing. Let's see what this bad boy can do. Hold my beer. And I'll close with, with this story, and this one is one that's near and dear to, to my heart. The gentleman on the left, First Lieutenant Henry Bellman, grew up not too far from where I did in Oklahoma, in a wheat field. During the Depression, his dad had had mules. About 1932, 1933, dad makes the decision to sell the mules. They replace them with Alice Chalmers tractors to continue to work the wheat field. Then when, when war breaks out, Bellman, who had recently graduated from Oklahoma A&M College, goes and enlists in the Marine Corps, ends up as a tanker. And while he's training with a light M5 tank, he's zipping around one day on the training fields out in California, makes a sharp turn, and that tank throws its track. And Bellman, having grown up around machines all his life, gets out and pulls out a crowbar and he's telling his driver, pull up forward, back up, pull up, back up. And in about five to 10 minutes, manages to get the track back on that tank and he's rolling again. Now, he's captured the attention of an officer who is trying to fill out the leadership positions in his tank battalion. And he said, calls Bellman over, he says, how'd you know how to do that? Now, you know, grew up on the farm, dad had tractors. It's what we did. You're my platoon leader. Bellman subsequently tells this captain, now, the types of guys you want in your tank battalion, recognizing that the Marines don't have an ordnance and maintenance battalion like the Army does in an armored division, the Marine tankers themselves are going to have to take care of first, second, third order maintenance oil changes, spark plugs, carburetors, those sorts of things. Bellman tells his commanders, you want the 4-H and the FFA boys because they were the ones that were around machines. They're going to make your job a whole lot easier. So they put together the 4th Marine Tank Battalion from guys like this. They're men like Bellman, oil field roughnecks, guys with machines, machine understanding, and they begin modifying their tanks to meet the needs that they encounter in combat. The Japanese tried to stick magnetic mines to the sides of their tanks. So they get wooden planks and they space them off the tank hull, two inch pieces of pine. After the first time they look at that, they say, wow, you know, that looks like a form 
we could pour concrete in there. So that's what they do in between the tank hull and the plank. Let's put some sandbags up over the hatches and the vents so that in case the Japanese toss satchel charges, we'll have a little bit more protection. In case they try to do it over the hatch, let's build some metal cages, bird cages we can call them. Mount those up on top so the satchel charge will be high enough away that most of its explosive force will be de detonated. And let's worry about the guys on the ground too. We got some old gas tanks. If we wash them out really good and we mount them with bungs and spigots, the Marines on the ground, when they run out of water on Iwo Jima, they can come and, you know, it might taste a little funny, but at least it's wet. And then the real innovation. How do you communicate from the inside of the tank to the outside of the tank in a way that's meaningful? Same kind of challenge that we're seeing with the P-47s that result in Casada's imp improvements. On the side of the waiting stack, we'll paint a target clock. And on the top, at 12 o'clock, it'll say front. And then on the back of the tank's fender, we can hang a phone and wire that into the intercom so that Marine, a leatherneck, grabs that phone and says, I need suppressing fire at 1230 low. What does the tank know? Ratchet that turret down that tube, 1230, and put a couple of rounds in whatever's there. Now, this same sort of improvement, communication inside the outside of the tank, that Bellman is using in the Pacific, is being developed at the same time by American tankers a half a world away in Normandy. Why? They come from the same place. They have this access to technology the ability to tinker. Leadership, who is going to take what they do. Bellman goes through three different tanks in the Pacific. Every time they get a new round of tanks, when they go from, from um, one type of engine to another, they go out and do the same modifications. It spills over to other tank battalions who are going to do the same thing. They all have certain traits in common. I would argue this is American ingenuity that's understood by most American commanders throughout World War II, and certainly by Dwight Eisenhower in his 1948 memoirs, recognized explicitly the trained American possesses qualities that are unique initiative, resourcefulness, adaptability to change. When you put all this together, becomes a most formidable soldier. This is American ingenuity in World War II, and I would argue one of the reasons the Allies win. Thank you.